Lord, it is such a privilege to worship you as your church. These lyrics must sound so strange to a world that has never known forgiveness of sin or the gift of a clean conscience. To be singing songs together here this morning to someone who the world has not seen. To be singing songs about shed blood. It would seem so strange, preposterous, absurd, unintelligent, foolish. And for us, it's, it's our everything, it's our hope. And for us who are those who were your enemies, for us, us who know the bitterness of sinning against your name and sinning against your character, and for us who know the incredible, undeserved gift of having the, the slate wiped clean, our guilt washed and removed, the ledger to be completely erased. Lord, we know that when, when you came, you were the high priest of good things to come. You were the high priest who did not enter an earthly tabernacle. You entered a perfect tabernacle. You entered the actual tabernacle, the one that Moses saw on the mountain, the one that was the original that created the template for the one he built on earth. You entered into the very presence, Lord Jesus, of your Father. And you didn't bring the blood of bulls and goats. You didn't bring the blood of animals. You didn't bring the blood of sinful men. You brought your own blood. Perfect blood, righteous blood. A righteous life laid down and offered in the presence of your Father. And you obtained for us eternal redemption. And Lord, we're just, we, we just love the thought of being able to praise you for your shed blood. If the blood of those old sacrifices could actually cleanse a temple and cleanse instruments and utensils and lavers and basins, how much more will your blood cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve you, the living God? So Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, we just begin by thanking you and praising you for your blood that was shed. And Lord Jesus, we also continue to pray that as we look at, at your word, you would minister to our hearts, continue to equip us and train us, show us your glory, show us what we need to see from this most interesting individual, this Syrophoenician woman. Show us what we must learn from her example, and we pray that you would glorify your name in our hearts. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to encourage you to grab your Bible as well and open up to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at the story of this Syrophoenician woman. It begins in Mark 7, verse 24, and goes through verse 30. So let me read this, and I would encourage you to follow along. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre, and when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, 
she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. This is a most remarkable story. It's a story not of a man and not of a Jew, a Syrophoenician woman. This is a, actually a very significant transition, a change in the story of Mark. And so to properly appreciate this story, uh, we're going to have to dive in and do a little bit of context this morning. Uh, Before I do that, though, I titled this Defiled and Defenseless. Defiled and Defenseless. One of the most incredible aspects of this story is that here you have an unclean woman, unclean in the definition that Jesus gives in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, and Jesus tells her in no uncertain words that she is unclean and she does not defend herself against that accusation. She embraces it immediately and entirely. I'm always amazed by reading the gospel accounts and you see Jesus in all of his glory. You see still fleshed in humanity, but nevertheless his righteousness and his miracles and his self-attestation and his fulfillment of prophecy. And you see people seeing the signs and the wonders and the miracles and all the evidence. And you see people even believing that Jesus is who he said he was, believing that he's the Messiah, believing that he's the Son of God. But probably the better test is, do they believe that they are who Jesus says that they are? There's a lot of people who believe that Jesus is God. But what about when God says, you're defiled, you're unclean, you're sinful, you're hopeless, and you have no remedy apart from me? And that's what we have here. We have a woman who completely embraces the... uh, accusation without even flinching. This is very significant because this is really a transition from a part of the story that has been focused on Jesus' ministry as he's giving a lesson to the disciples. It's been focused on his ministry to Jews, and now he's transitioning to a period of ministry that's primarily to Gentiles. And so I want to back up a little bit and do a little bit of review about how Mark has structured his gospel, because this is one of those stories where we really need to pay attention to the structure as a whole if we're going to benefit from the story as Mark tells it. If, uh, if you've been here through our study of Mark, you might remember at the very beginning we looked at how Mark really breaks up his, his gospel, and a couple of the major ways that he shows us how he structures his story is through some geographical titles. And a geographical title is different than just a geographical reference. There's geographical references throughout the gospel. But occasionally, he'll make a title, he'll just make a complete statement, they went to a certain location, period. And it's not not just hanging there as a descriptor, telling you something necessary for the story. It's just like a geographical heading that kind of shows you uh, a section of the gospel. And so we saw this in chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, Mark writes, they went into Capernaum. And it's really kind of a, its own sentence in the original. It's just that's the sentence. They went to Capernaum. And it becomes a kind of a geographical title. And then the next time we see that is in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, which we're coming up on. And in 22, it just simply says they came to Bethsaida. And in this section, Mark chapter 1 through Mark chapter 8, the focus is on Jesus' shocking identity. Here's Jesus, this man from Nazareth, and his identity is he's the son of God, and nobody seems to get it, except the demons. The religious leaders don't seem to get it, the population doesn't seem to get it, and the disciples honestly don't seem to really fully get it, and that's part of the section that we're in right now. The, the, the second aspect that shows us how Mark breaks up this gospel is these refrains. This first section, Mark 1 through 8, the refrain is unbelief. The refrain is unbelief, and so if you remember... Go back to Mark chapter 3 for a second and look at verse 5 and 6. This is the conclusion to this first section of this, you know, act, if you want to call it Mark 1 through 8, act 1. Well, then this first section is really documenting the unbelief of the religious leaders. In in, in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Mark writes, after looking around at them, uh, the, the, the religious leaders who were there when he did this healing on the Sabbath, He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. 
the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. And here's just clear evidence. They are not believing who Jesus is. They refuse to accept his identity, and they plan to murder him from that point on. So the chapters 1 through 3 is focused on the unbelief of the religious leaders. And you see their hostility becoming increasingly external, increasingly verbalized, increasingly uh, hostility is just rising with each story. You get to chapters 3 through 6, and the focus is on the people of Israel, the nation, the population itself. And in chapter 6, verse 6, it just simply says, Jesus wondered at their unbelief. And in a section that's so full of wonder and marveling and amazement, Jesus is just blown away by the unbelief of the nation. And then in chapters 6 through 8, the focus is on the disciples. And this has happened several times in this section where Jesus has talked about their slowness to believe, their hardness of heart. Are you really understanding? He says that after the feeding of the 5,000, after walking on the water. And in chapter 8, verses 17 through 21, we find the third refrain, and listen to what he says. Mark writes, Jesus, aware of this, because they were debating about lunch, he had warned them about the doctrine of the Pharisees, and says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. And they thought, oh, okay, don't eat their bread, don't, don't buy lunch from them. And so Jesus is aware they're having this argument about lunch, and he says to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basket full, baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? He's been focusing on the disciples from chapter 6, 6b all the way through 821, uh, giving them instruction. In fact, He's been trying to kind of download with them after he sent them out on their mission. If you remember chapter 6, verses 7 through 30, the very first story in this section that's focused on the disciples is a story about sending them out on a mission. The 12 go out all over the nation, and they're supposed to go preach the gospel of repentance, and they have authority to over demons and to heal. So they can cast out demons, they can heal, and they're supposed to preach repentance. They come back from that journey... And they've flipped the order. They're talking about their authority over demons oh, and, and that they preached the gospel and they taught some things. Missing the fact that embedded in that story is the story of John the Baptist who successfully preached repentance and he got his head cut off for it. And they are in for some very important lessons about what it means to follow Christ and what it means to minister in his name. And so after they come back, it says in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 31, he said to the disciples, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going. They did not even have time to eat. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. But the very next verse says they saw, people saw them going and they recognized them and they ran there on foot and got there ahead of them. So they land on shore for this little deep, private debrief session and there's so many people that Jesus just starts to be burdened for them because they don't understand truth and he starts teaching and then they get exhausted and weary and he ends up feeding them miraculously. And then you're just on this incredible journey through all of these miraculous stories that we've looked at. And it's just a frenetic pace of ministry. And he does not even have time to catch his breath. In verse 24 of our passage, Jesus goes away from that location. He goes to the region of Tyre. He's still escaping from the spotlight with his disciples. And it seems to be that he's still trying to find time to instruct his disciples, to teach them, to explain to them, look, there's some things you're not getting about what it means to follow me and what it means to minister in my name. And then he goes to Tyre and he's, in trying to escape notice, and yet he still could not. And so there's still this incognito pursuit, and he's trying to minister to his disciples, and lo and behold, there's this woman who knows that he's there and finds out. This is an incredible uh, 
section, Mark chapter 6 through 8. There's a symmetry to it, and I, wanna, I want you to see this. I, I put it on a, um, a slide here, uh, I believe on the, the next slide. There's a parallelism to this section of the Gospel of Mark. It matches itself perfectly. It's like if you put a mirror between 723 and 724, and you, it just reflects back. Just what you see in, you know, coming before just repeats itself. And the, the first cycle is focused on ministry to the, in, in Jewish contexts, and the second half is focused on ministry in Gentile context. Notice in the first half of this section where Jesus is teaching the disciples what he needs to teach them, there's a casting out of demons and healing in chapters 6, 7 through 30. Then there's feeding of the 5,000. And then he crosses the lake, and then he's attacked by Pharisees, and then a discourse on uncleanness. Now, at our, at our point in the story, 724, it just cycles itself all over again. It's almost a parallel image. In 724, with the Syrophoenician woman, if we can go to the next slide there, you're going to see there's a casting out of a demon once again, and healing in our next story, the healing uh, in Tyre, uh, sorry, in Sidon and the De- De- Decapolis, there's this healing of somebody who is mute. And so uh, in 630, they were healing sick. Here, they're healing, he's heal- heals a mute person. In chapters 8, 1 through 9, he feeds the 4,000. He crosses the lake again, and then there's a discourse on Doctrine 11. And it's just a, an incredible parallel as Mark portrays this story of Christ. What's so profound is where this is, the majority of this has taken place. Look again at the geographical comments in verse 24. Jesus went away from there to the region of Tyre. And he was in Galilee in their previous narrative. And rabbis, high-ranking rabbis from Jerusalem come up to deal with Jesus' you know, teaching that is undermining their human tradition. So he leaves Galilee and goes to Tyre. And I have a, a slide. Hopefully this will work. I've never done this before. I put a map up here. We're going to see how this... It looks great on my computer. That's what I was afraid of. It looks great on a laptop, but not so great here. If you can see on, on the map, I'll try to point it out. There's three, three locations that are in red. You might be able to see Galilee, depending on how your eyes are. There are Galilee in black right next to the Sea of Galilee, dead center. If you go straight up from that G, there's a, a red, the red word tire. That's on the coast, the Mediterranean coast. Then you keep going further north, you'll see Sidon all the way at the top of the map. And then if you come all the way back down on the, on the eastern side of the Jordan River, you see Decapolis in red. Those three geographical markers are important because in 724, Jesus leaves Galilee, right there, think of him, on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, and he goes straight up north to Tyre, up into a Gentile area, modern day Lebanon. Now, look down at chapter... 7 verse 31 again he went out from the region of Tyre and he came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of the Decapolis okay let's look at our map once again uh he was in Tyre on the west coast on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea the west the the shore there of, of of Lebanon goes up to Sidon to get to Decapolis you see what you see what what's so shocking about verse 20 about verse 31 He's going to the Decapolis through Sidon. He's going out of his way to stay out of Israel, and he's just ministering in Gentile communities. They're just walking through soil after soil, town after town, home after home of unclean Gentiles. Casting demons out of Gentiles. Healing Gentiles feeding, miraculously, Gentiles. It's no coincidence that Mark puts all of this immediately on the heels of Jesus' discussion about defilement. What does it mean to be defiled? What does it mean to be impure? What does it mean to be corrupt? It is not a failure to obey man-made traditions, It's not what happens outside of you. It's not circumstantial. It's not what goes into you. It's what comes out of you. We're defiled by our hearts. And Jesus is teaching this in in no uncertain terms to the disciples. And this first lesson is incredible. This first lesson is taught. It's put on full display between the two major characters in this story, Jesus and this Syrophoenician woman. 
And so I realized that was a kind of a long introduction to the, for the context here this morning, but I think it's essential, and I think this story is going to make um, much more sense to you if you can keep that in, your, in the back of your mind as we look at these details. Now, let's get ready here to dive in. Verse 24 and verse 25, Mark's, Mark introduces us to this, to this woman. He's up in Tyre, and he's, he's clearly there to escape notice. He's clearly there to not draw attention to himself. He wants privacy with his disciples. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's there. He tries to slip into a house, and it says he could not escape notice. Verse 25, but after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. I would love to have seen the, the, this scene. Did she just come storming into the house? I mean, they probably just find some house, and there's some sort of, maybe they're connection, or maybe they're just renting a house for the night. It doesn't say, those details aren't matter, uh, important. But just, th- th- this is an incredible move on this woman's part. She knows, here is someone who can help. Here is someone who speaks truth. Verse 26 uh, explains that the woman was a Gentile. I mean, think about how many strikes are against this person. Dude, this is an unlikely hero for this story. First of all, she's a woman. Secondly, she's a Gentile. Third, they're in Tyre, which is uh, clearly foreign territory, and Josephus describes the people of Tyre as notoriously our bitterest enemies. And when he says our, he's speaking of the Jews. Josephus was not a Christian. He was a Jew, a Jewish historian from the first century. So they are bitter enemies of the Jews, these people from Tyre. She's a woman. She's a Gentile. She's from Tyre, if it couldn't get any worse. Her daughter's condition is deplorable because verse 25 says unclean spirit. Same word from our discussion about uncleanliness, not uncleanliness, uncleanness, uh, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Unlike unclean spirit likely means that this is a, she's, she's ritually impure, ceremonially impure. She's also a Syrophoenician. The Phoenicians uh, inhabited the promised land before, before Israel um, uh, took, took over and in, in the deliverance of the, um, in the, in the Torah, when you read the story of how God brings them to the, uh, to the, the, the front door, they're the back door really of the promised land. And then he finally delivers them into their hand in, in Joshua. It would have been inhabited by Canaanites or Phoenicians. And in fact, Matthew's account of this story calls her a Canaanite. Mark calls her a Syrophoenician. There were Phoenicians in North Africa, the Libya Phoenicians, and this is a Syrophoenician, uh, you know, modern day Syria would be uh, right there in that same location. And so this is a nearby enemy of Israel, and as I mentioned, Matthew even uses the word Canaanite, but this would be the people group that according to Deuteronomy 7 should not exist. Just think about this for a second. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy, and this is what Moses tells or reveals of God's will for the, for the nation when they're going into the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 16, God says, You shall consume all the peoples whom the Lord your God will deliver to you. Your eyes shall not pity them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. These are people who uh, hate the Lord and are worshiping all sorts of idols. They are worshiping themselves, and they are in animosity, not only to God and to his people, to, but to his people. And of course, there were people from within the promised land who were converted and became part of Israel. Um, Rahab and, and her family would be a good example of that. But the command is to wipe out all the idolaters in the promised land, because they're going to be a snare to the worship of Yahweh among the people of God. And so the command is to wipe out everyone, to wipe out all idolatry, so the land would be completely consecrated to the worship of Yahweh, exclusively. Now, what's interesting is, well, how, did that, how did they do? How did that go down? Let's, let's skip over to Joshua chapter 16, verse 10. And listen to this. In Joshua 16, the narrator says, But they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day. 
and they became forced laborers. Isn't that interesting? If Israel had been consecrated to the Lord, if they'd been totally devoted to Yahweh, if they'd relied on him entirely, and if they had obeyed the Lord fully, this woman wouldn't even be alive. Her entire race of idolatrous race would have been eradicated. Of course, genetically, any Canaanite who worshipped Yahweh would have been become part of the nation. That's not the point. The point is not, it's not genetics. The point is the idolatry. But this woman wouldn't be alive. Her ancestry would have been wiped out. And so here she comes, perhaps barging into the house where they're trying to remain hidden, perhaps beating down the door, and she falls at his feet asking for help. In verse 20. Seven, it just says that Jesus was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first. For it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And we've got we to slow down here for a second. That, that verse is, is challenging. You know, when you read this, you, you might think, wait a minute. Jesus sounds like you've got, a, you've got a, a needy, desperate woman seeking help from him. And it sounds like he just flat out kind of just almost throws it in her face like, leave me alone, don't talk to me. Matthew's, Matthew's account is even, records even what sounds like even more harshness when just, he just refuses to answer her. He's, she's asking for help and he just doesn't even answer. And the disciples are like, do you want us to send her away? Because she's really annoying us. She's following us, calling out. Like, this is getting, we're getting really tired of her following us around and crying out for help. And it just, because he wasn't, he wasn't answering her. Now Mark doesn't record his refusal to answer her he just records when he finally does decide to answer her but still even what he records in his answer (laughs) sounds quite shocking i mean isn't this just a woman who's looking for help and he turns around and just basically calls her a dog i mean look at verse 27 let the children be satisfied first he's talking about uh, like what happens in any given day in that day and age at the dinner table you've got the kids and they're around the table and mom's prepared a meal and he says it's not good to take the food that was made it was worked hard for it was saved up for it was purchased and acquired and prepared and then baked and then brought to the table and then made for those kids you don't just take the kids meal and throw it to the dogs I mean, what is going on here? Is Jesus indifferent to this woman's plight? Is, she heartless? is he heartless? Cold? Doesn't care? Not at all. Not at all. First of all, don't, don't, don't lose sight of the fact that he actually came to Tyre in the first place. He's, this is not some sort of like, you know, I can't stand these people. I mean, he actually went there. He just went away from the spotlight, away from the limelight. Now, it's true if we're, if we're tracking with Mark up to this point, that the people in Tyre had already been exposed to him. You can read about that in Mark chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. People from Tyre had already come down to Israel to see Jesus' ministry. So it's not that he's unknown, it's just that he would be less known, and he went to get away. So this is not, this is not like a despising of the people of Tyre. He's, he went there in the first place. But secondly, consider, there are all sorts of, false and idolatrous reasons why people would come to Jesus. I mean, here's a woman whose child is possessed by a demon. Let's just put ourselves in her shoes for a second. Uh, you, you parents, I don't even need to flesh this out. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. I mean, I remember the first time I saw a movie uh, where a father went off to war and he kissed his children goodbye in the middle of the night as he'd been called to a mission. And uh, my, my six-month-old was asleep in the other room. And I'm just bawling like a baby. Just an intense, an intense love for my children. I mean, I could have seen that movie as a, a bachelor and be like, hey, that was a good movie, whatever. And all of a sudden here I'm just crying like a baby because dad said goodbye to his kids. He's off to war. No, he's leaving the kids. Put yourself in this woman's shoes for a second. 
to watch your child suffer. This daughter has a very difficult life. It's miserable. She's tormented. Never a moment's relief. Think about the fear on the part of a mom. Think about the longings for deliverance. Think about the fears of this daughter's future. What's she even going to do when she gets older? She's a threat to herself and everyone around her. There's probably a thousand and one reasons why any, anyone in that situation could come to Christ for help. Jesus' apparent harshness or what you might at first glance picture as cold indifference is brilliance. As we read the entire story, it has the effect of exposing the real reason why she came. It's an object lesson for the disciples, and it puts true and saving faith on display. And so whatever we do with verse 27, we have to read it in light of all the story, including the positive climax in verses 28 to 30. And so do not read verse 27 in a vacuum. But we're not quite ready to resolve it. There's actually more problems. This is going to get worse because I've got to explain some things in verse 27. So it's going to even sound more harsh here for a moment. So just bear with me. How inappropriate to take the food of children and give it to someone else. But he doesn't even say how it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to someone else. He says it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Whoa! Okay, now, does that, is that below the belt? That sounds like a personal insult. Just call this woman a dog. What's going on here? Well, obviously a dog is unclean. Leviticus 11.27 says... Also, whatever walks on its paws among all the creatures that walk on all fours are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcasses shall be unclean until evening. Exodus 22, verse 31 says, you shall, be, you shall be holy men to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh torn to pieces in the field. That means it died in an unclean way, and it could be impure meat and defiled. And so if you eat it, you would be defiled. And then it says this, at the end of verse 31 Moses writes that God said, you shall throw it to the dogs. It's only appropriate. Meat killed inappropriately in the field is only appropriate for unclean animals like dogs to eat. So just, that's dog food. No wonder when you get to the New Testament that dogs and pigs are the classic go-to metaphor for something that's unclean, defiled, impure. Matthew chapter six, 7, verse 6, Jesus says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. In Luke sixteen twenty one, in the story about Lazarus and the rich man, you know, the rich man had, had everything. But Lazarus, what he had was, he was longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, living off of the crumbs that fell off of the table, living like a dog. And then Jesus even says in verse 21, at the end of verse 21, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Not only a miserable existence, but then totally unclean. Dogs are licking his sores. He's unclean, and meanwhile getting cleaned by unclean animals like a dog. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul writes, Beware of the dogs. And he's speaking of false teachers. He's speaking of theologians who are not faithful to the gospel as revealed through the apostles. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Peter, he doesn't miss out either. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, It has happened to them, talking about false teachers in the early church, it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. And again, he uses the pig and a dog in the same verse to talk about uncleanliness and somebody who's defiled, who's impure, who's a threat to the church. 
Finally, at the end of the Bible, John closes out the Revelation. And in chapter 22, he says in verse 15, outside, outside the kingdom, outside uh, heaven on earth, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. They're outside the kingdom. Who's outside the kingdom? Dogs. Anybody who's defiled, anybody who's impure, anybody who practices lying, anybody who's an idolater, anybody who does any of those things, and their life is characterized by those things. In the Old Testament, uncleanness makes one guilty. In Leviticus 5, if you touch a corpse, you're unclean, and he will be guilty. In Leviticus 7, if you eat of the sacrifice um, of a peace offering while being ceremonially unclean, you are cut off from the people. The idea, the term here for unclean means to be ceremonially unclean, to, to defile oneself or to be defiled. Uh, the, the, con- the significance of this concept is that one is spiritually defiled. They are guilty, worthy of being cut off from the people of God, taken outside the camp and to be burned. What would defile a worshiper could be sexual impurity and perversion, so that those who practice such things are actually like the nations. And Leviticus 18 says, Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by these things the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. Coming to the Lord's temple after worshiping Molech would defile the temple. Touching a corpse, and that was in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 3, in Leviticus 21, touching a corpse, uh, which is a result of the fall, and obviously death was a result of the fall, and so now a corpse is because of death, then that would defile you. In Leviticus 21. To be defiled means to be worthy of cu- being cut off, cast out, outside the presence of God, outside the people of God. It means you are guilty. It means you are unclean. You are impure. And so Jesus says to her, in response to her plea for help, can you cast this demon out of my daughter? He says, you know what? It's not appropriate to take the kid's bread. The kids are the Jews. The kids are the people of God. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. And when Jesus sent out the 12 in Matthew's parallel of Mark 6, he says, and go only to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel. He sends them to Israel and here he tells this Syrophoenician woman, don't, don't, you, don't, you don't get the kid's bread. It's not appropriate to take the kid's bread and throw it to dogs. Verse 28, but she answered and said to him, excuse me? I mean, this response. Look at this response. Yes, Lord. You think about the significance of what Jesus just said in verse 27. What's the true definition of defilement? Being born a Syrophoenician? No. Having a heart that produces, verse 21, evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, verse 22, deeds of coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. That's the definition of defilement. And Jesus says, I'm not taking bread from kids and giving it to the dogs. And she says, yep, I get it. True. Guilty as charged. She agrees entirely. She unflinchingly says, yes, Lord, and admits, I'm a dog. Look at how she says it. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. She doesn't defend herself. She doesn't deflect. She embraces the accusation entirely. I mean, there is so much wit and repartee here. It's reflected in Christ's brilliance in this humble woman's faith. It's just incredible. Jesus introduces a discussion about bread. And she 
turns and responds with this meager hope for crumbs. Consider that Jesus loves to use bread and grain as a metaphor for spiritual nourishment. He does that all through the Gospels. And in fact, it's all through the Old Testament as well. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Isaiah 55, it's interesting, and I'll turn to Isaiah 55 for a moment. Isaiah 55 is such a helpful text on this connection, this, this frequent connection between bread and the word. In Isaiah 55, verse 1, Isaiah writes, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. He's talking to people who have no resources. And this is not talking about the financially destitute, the financially... Um, uh, poor. It's not talking about some sort of welfare society where they, they need you know, some, some, some stamps. This is, you have no spiritual resources. You have nothing spiritually to sustain yourself. You have no wine, no milk, no bread, and you have no money to get it. So why would you spend all your money and all your labor and all your efforts to get something that cannot satisfy your soul? Skip down to chapter 55, verses 8 through 11. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I mean, we're getting to the heart of what it means to have the word of God. You're getting the heart and mind of God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So the person who has no money to buy bread, wine, or milk and has no resources to begin with come to God who will cause his word to rain down and will not allow it to be void. It will produce its intended effect. We don't live by physical bread, wine, and and milk. We live by the word of God. And so we fast forward back to Mark, and Jesus has already used grain to symbolize the word. Remember the parable of the sower and the seed? What does the seed symbolize? According to Mark 4.14, the the seed is the word of God. In chapter 6, verse 34, he obviously feeds the 5,000 with physical bread, but why was he feeding them with physical bread to begin with? Because he saw this crowd of people who were sheep without a shepherd, and they needed truth. And he began teaching them many things in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. So he sees them, and they don't have instruction. They don't have what they need, namely truth and and, and the the gospel and the word of God. And so he begins to teach them so many things that they're growing weak and famished. And so he just feeds them physically to sustain them so he can continue to give them truth. And then, as I mentioned already, at the end of this section, in chapter 8, verses 11 to 13, there's this showdown again with the Pharisees. And then in verse 15, he's warning the disciples about their doctrine and to watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They still think he's talking about physical bread. He's talking about truth. He's talking about uh, how they think of God and what they know to be true of the gospel. And that's what he's trying to protect them from. And in this quick repartee, back and forth, between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, he introduces bread, and she just says, I don't even need a loaf. I'm, I'm content with crumbs. The wit of this woman reflects a profound faith. In fact, in Matthew um, 15, 28, the parallel account, Jesus says to the woman, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. This woman believes Christ. She she, she believes Christ. She trusts Christ. She embraces his self-disclosed identity as the Son of God. But so did a lot of people. What sets this woman apart? There's more to believing than 
Jesus is who he says he is, she believes that she is who Jesus says that she is. This is the better test of one's faith because he defines uncleanness and defilement. He defines what it means to have a guilty heart in chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. Of course, the Pharisees didn't understand the showdown that happened in verses 1 through 13. The disciples are still confused, so he starts to explain it even more in verses 14 to 23. And then they're still probably scratching their heads because he shows up in Tyre and he needs some more time with his disciples privately. And this woman shows up begging for help and puts on a clinic. He points the finger and says, you're a dog. And she says, you're right. All I want is some scraps, even crumbs. I'd be content for crumbs. No defense. Our problem is not that we have a few problems, a few needs, a few lacks, a few failures. Our problem is that we are head to toe sick with sin. Our problem is our guilt. Our problem is our uncleanness, our internal, our essential defilement before God. And this woman shows us that admitting and acknowledging our impurity is necessary to follow Christ. It is necessary for following Christ. I'm going to take a few minutes and just highlight a few passages. Just think about this for a second. You can follow along if you want. I'm going to jump around through through a few passages for a moment. Or you can just listen. In the Sermon on the Mount, remember how Jesus begins. In the Beatitudes, the very first um, words of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are spiritually destitute, bankrupt, poverty-stricken. They have no spiritual resources. Those are the ones to whom belongs the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. These are the people who mourn over their sin. They, they are grieved when they sin against God. They're grieved when they offend God. They are grieved by everything that would come out of their heart that would be loathsome to the Lord. People who mourn over their sin shall be comforted. I mean, this characterizes kingdom citizens. This acknowledgement of guilt, this ownership of internal defilement, in Luke chapter 7, we see that this acknowledgement of guilt, this ownership of defilement, like the Syrophoenician woman, actually determines whether people respond to the gospel or not. In Luke chapter 7, let me read it to you, sorry, I forgot the wrong reference there. Luke seven twenty-eight to 30, um, Jesus is talking about this uh, John the Baptist, and he says, I, I say to you, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does that mean? As far as human greatness goes, there's no greater role than to be the forerunner for the Messiah. You want to define tasks and jobs given to men by God? Uh, John's was number one. That's what that means. That's the greatest calling you can imagine, to be the forerunner for the Messiah? Wow. And then he flips to the opposite side and says, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Not a statement that John's not in the kingdom. A statement that, as far as it goes with earthly greatness and earthly significance, being number one on earthly significance ranks below being the last ranking citizen in the kingdom. It's that important. It's that significant. It's that great. So he says this in the next verse. When all the people... And the tax collectors heard this. They acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. What's the logic here? Jesus makes a statement that earthly significance, here's your ranking. It starts right here, goes down to here. Number one, I'll tell you, is John the Baptist. Now let's talk about heavenly significance. Here's number one, here's the blast ranking Christian. And it's way over John, (laughs) way over earthly significance. It's a truth that your earthly significance plays no contribution to making it into the kingdom. That's the logic. And when they hear that message, it totally 
polarizes the audience. You have individuals hearing that message who are like the Syrophoenician woman. They know they are unclean. They have admitted their guilt. They have acknowledged, I am essentially wicked and core, uh, to, corrupt to the core of my being. And those are the people, the tax collectors, they hear this and they acknowledge God's justice because they've been baptized by John, a baptism of admission. I am a sinner. I need to be cleansed. And so to acknowledge, I have no earthly significance to speak of. I'm empty-handed. God says, you're making it into the kingdom has nothing to do with earthly, earthly significance. And they're like, amen and amen. And the other half of the audience, they're not like the Syrophoenician woman. They won't acknowledge their guilt. They won't acknowledge that they're defiled, that they're impure at the core of their being. Particularly, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. How do they think about themselves? They think about themselves according to earthly significance. They believe that their earthly significance and their religious significance even contributes to their position in the kingdom. And Jesus singularly just neutralizes that entire thing and shows that the rejection and acceptance of the kingdom really is going to be shown in how you respond to Jesus pointing the finger saying, you're unclean, you're a dog. Look at John chapter 8. I'm going to give you an example of some Jews who went halfway. They went halfway with the Syrophoenician woman. Like the Syrophoenician woman, they would have been thoroughly convinced that Jesus had the power to cast out demons. Like the Syrophoenician woman, they would have been thoroughly convinced of his identity. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He talks about um, being his Father being in heaven, so they know that he's, he's the Son of God. He's claiming to be the Son of God in verses 1 through 30. And so verse 30 of John chapter 8 says, As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So they believe what he's saying. They believe his identity. They believe in his who he is. Yep, you're Jesus of Nazareth, but you're the Son of God. I believe it. I absolutely believe it. You're talking about it right here in the, in the, in the temple at the Feast of Lights ceremony. I'm tracking with you, Jesus. I am all in. Verse 31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him. He's speaking to Jews who believe in Jesus' identity. They would have believed Jesus is the Son of God. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they said to him, we are Abraham's descendants, and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you have heard from your father. And these Jews he, whom he is speaking to are the sons of Satan. Sons of Satan can hear the gospel, they can read the gospels, they can read the New Testament epistles, they can believe the doctrine, they can believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Satan would love for them to be complacent about their orthodoxy and their Christology. But the sons of Satan won't admit that they're defiled. And Jesus points the finger here and says, if you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine, and the truth will set you free. And they say in verse 39, Abraham's our father, and Jesus said, If Abraham's if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham, but as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father. And they said, we're born, We were not born in fornication, we have one father, God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. Verse 44, you are of your father the devil, and you do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when you skip down to verse 
59, they picked up stones to throw at him. So Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They had an orthodox Christology. In verse 30 and 31, what happened? Jesus pointed his finger at them and said, you're dogs. And they wanted to kill him. The Syrophoenician woman readily agreed to that. I think the Syrophoenician woman believed a truth that Isaiah talked about. In Isaiah chapter 64, it pictures the unclean and their need for righteousness. Listen to Isaiah 64, verses 4 through 7. From days of old they have not heard or perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, for we sinned. We continued in them a long time, and shall we be saved? For all of us have become like one who is unclean. Again, the the unclean reality here is an internal, spiritual reality. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Even the good things we've done externally have been defiled because our hearts are unclean. All of us wither like a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your, your face from us and have delivered us into the power of iniquities. And so here is somebody who needs righteousness. They need to be clothed with righteousness. Listen, until, until God starts giving grace to the proud, we need to keep focusing on the bad news. The bad news is we are all defiled. We are all unclean. We are all dogs. And this woman put on a clinic. She outshined the Pharisees who didn't get it. She outshined the disciples who were still struggling to put it together. And she completely took ownership of the intrinsic uncleanness within I want to challenge you as you're thinking about the uh, benefit of this example of the Seraphonician woman. There's a few ways that we sometimes get into trouble when it comes to acknowledging our, our inward defilement. You know, the first thing I thought of was self-evaluation. Sometimes we try to evaluate our uncleanness and we don't actually look at God's standard or God's evaluation of his word and we just come up with evaluations on our own. Our heart is more deceitful than all else. We will deceive ourselves 100% of the time. Sin speaks to the ungodly within his heart and flatters himself so that he cannot discover his iniquity. He cannot even hate his own iniquity. And so don't, don't rely on self-evaluation. The second way we might find a way around acknowledging our our guilt is to acknowledge respectable guilt. This is kind of a, it's really a face-saving way of deflection. We we might sometimes acknowledge and confess guilt that's a little bit easier to acknowledge so that we we don't want to look at the, the worst guilt. Hosea 5.15 says, I, the Lord, will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Maybe another way we would do it would be to acknowledge sins, plural, but not sin, categorically. The idea that, yeah, everybody makes mistakes, but to admit that I make mistakes because I'm corrupt at the core is a totally different confession. To admit that I've done something wrong is is not enough. To admit that I do things wrong because I love them, that's a different kind of confession. Jesus is pointing his finger saying, you're a dog. And she says, yep, I am. She's admitting that I myself am wrong. And she's willing to acknowledge that the sins external reveal that she is sinful at the core. Consider what these defiling things of chapter 7, verses 20 to 23 indicate. We looked at that a few weeks ago. It's not just that you need to do better, but that you can't do better with a defiled and impure heart. You must do better, but you can't on your own. 
You need the powerful word of God to give you a new heart, to give you power over sin so that you can obey him. And this woman knew that. And rather than defend herself, she's content to beg for undeserved crumbs. And we do the same. Father, thank you so much for this Syrophoenician woman and this example. As we think about what this means for us, Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to see ourselves rightly. Uh, There's probably no greater testimony to your love and your care for us than the exposure of sin and the path to finding hope and help. Thank you for conviction. Thank you for the truth that shows us our need. And thank you for For those of us who are even Gentiles, thank you for giving us crumbs. Lord, thank you for seeing us in our plight, in our sin, in our hopelessness. We we certainly were those who were outside. We were the outcast, the hopeless, the helpless, the unclean, the impure, the defiled. We had no hope of God. We had no hope of you. We were without any promise. We were outside your people. And yet you brought us near by your shed blood. And so, Lord, to think that we have an answer and we know hope for the essential, innate defilement, that we have an answer for that. And that we have um, a clear path forward by way of humility so that we could always be honoring to you at the core of our being this is such a privilege may this be our our place of worship may we be content to to worship you uh, gladly acknowledging we are dogs please give us crumbs we don't even deserve those but we still will beg and thank you for answering You answer us lavishly. You answer us abundantly by giving us your truth. And so, Lord, um, may we follow in the example of this woman all of our days. Give us grace that we would always do that. And this morning, Lord, for any who are hearing something like this for the first time, perhaps they've never even considered that they are, their problem is much worse than what they've done, that their problem is actually who they are. I pray that they would talk to someone who knows you. I pray they would talk to the person who brought them or, or seek me out or any of the, the elders and find hope and find answers from you in your word. That's the only safe place for them. So I pray that you would grant that conversation. Um, and now as we sing your praises, Lord, I pray that you be honored as we worship you in song. In your name we pray. Amen.